it's a pleasure to have you in this uh, series of research presentation that uh, the Center of, Insti uh, Center of Wisdom and Leadership at SPJMR has uh, begun. And we're really honored to have you because you are one of the, uh, let's say, inspiration for us, uh, bringing together wisdom and leadership. And this is an area where uh, really we have to learn from uh, international researchers and uh, also expand the work uh, that we can do in that uh, in that field. And um, so today's uh, subject matter will be uh, uh, leading in a dangerous world. And uh, so uh, the floor is yours, uh, Bernard. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sarai, for your kind words. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, uh, I, uh, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to have a look at uh, the two video presentations. Um, the first of those might have seemed a little bit odd for a, <laughs> for a business school, um, but I definitely wanted to uh, begin that way. Um, the, uh, if we could just have a look at that. Uh, if I could just, uh, oh, good heavens, come back. Um, if I could just um, very quickly go through that and talk about why um, I did that, um, I just thought, well, let's begin at the beginning. You know, 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang. Uh, and it, oddly, the other night I was at my sister's place and I was talking to, would you believe, an astrophysicist. Um, and I was absolutely blown away by, I mean, I had all this sort of desultory knowledge, but I was just blown away by, you know, by his recollection of the, or his account of the universe. But yeah, so then 400 million years later, there's the first atoms appear. Then 3.5 billion years ago, the first microbes. And the reason I say that is that this is the beginning of photosynthesis. So, you know, multicellular life begins 3.5 billion years ago, and that relationship between the sun, plants, and animals and people begin. Uh, and then we can see how quickly <laughs> in geologic time things move. The first <laughs> animals appear in 800 million. But then we have the Cambrian explosion. And then 66 million years ago, the asteroid hitting in Mexico, creating the nuclear winter, which wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, and then it's only 9 to 14 million years ago that the first humanoids appear. And only 100,000 years ago, that Australopithecus appears, and, and uh, sorry, um, uh, Homo sapiens. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that because I, I want to reinforce, I suppose, the sense of awe that I think that we've lost. I don't know whether young people in India use the same term, but in Australia, uh, young people use the word awesome. And every time I hear it, I want to hit them on the head with a piece of timber and say, no, no, it, no, awesome doesn't mean just good. Awe means to be so enraptured so uh, blown away by the by the significance of something uh, and I think we've lost that sense of awe uh, which I think is very important so the point that I then also want to take here is that from this ancient tradition uh, there's a sense of oneness and connectedness that uh, was existent in pre-modern life a belief in an underlying life force um, where there was a sense of belongingness. Um, and yet, you know, we skip forward to the early 20th century and we, you know, we see the writings of Emile, Emile Durkheim talking about anomie in an industrialized society. Um, so just very quickly, what I suppose, just jumping to the bottom there, that, you know, what, what happens is I'm not being anti-scientific, I'm not being anti-technological, uh, you know, it's produced amazing things. And, you know, I would not be alive on this planet, you know, were it not for uh, the, the sort of scientific knowledge in medicine that, that occurred. Uh, so I'm not being 
anti-science, anti-technology at all. Um, but I'm saying that uh, what has happened is that we've become anthropocentric rather than cosmocentric. Um, and that so instrumental re reason and material relationships uh, characterize um, the way that we live. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to also <laughs> just go back. Um, a chap that I found very, very readable is uh, Charles Guignon, uh, who talks about the authentic self. Um, and uh, he picks up, you know, from this ancient notion of oneness and connectedness, that this is what he means by being authentic. So in today's presentation, I just want to uh, pick up where Ali uh, left off last time. Um, Ali uh, uh, presented a, an, out, an excellent outline of, of wisdom. Um, and uh, today I wanted to apply Ali's theory um, at a macro, meso and micro level. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it, but just Quickly, what I mean by these, at the micro level, I'm talking about the self and others. Um, the meso level, I'm talking about organisations and work. And at the macro level, I'm talking about national and international. So I'm going to organise what I say along those lines. And then finally, uh, we'll have quickly talk about the way forward. Now, just going to Ali's presentation, um, <clears throat> You can see that what he's done here is to talk about multi-perspectival consideration, which involves uh, perspective taking, future thinking, and ethical consideration. But these come out of, um, at the very bottom, the capacity for internal reflection, capacity for external reflection, which then leads into cognitive emotional mastery and self-other awareness, self-awareness and other awareness. Um, so that was a very useful model to begin with. Uh, this is another model that Ali uh, developed and which we used in our wise leadership classes. And I think that it's an extremely good model. Um, so at the bottom, we have this, uh, or the second bottom line, we have this practical wisdom and theoretical wisdom. And so when David and I um, began writing about wisdom, oh, gee, Dave, 17 years ago, <laughs> I'm feeling old. Um, the you know we did say uh, that we put practical in front of it because it's no use thinking of wisdom as you know some guru sitting on top of a hill remote from society. The wisdom has to be practical. In fact, I almost want the word practical to not even be there um, because you know wisdom should be understood as being practical. So um, so what is necessary, and this is all, all derives from Aristotle's work, uh, is that you have the difference between phronesis, uh, which is practical wisdom, and theoretical wisdom, which is theoretical reasoning or sophia. So it's a difference between what should be done and what is true. Then we move up in, and underlying that theoretical wisdom is scientific knowledge and intuition. And it's very important to understand that Aristotle uh, not only saw the place for the episteme um, or knowledge, uh, but he also understood the necess necessity of having intuition or noose, uh, or now some people pronounce it. Um, so these, these two aspects develop wisdom, and wisdom is manifested in both moral virtue, virtue and intellectual virtue. And by doing that, I'm going to talk later about embodiment. If we embody those moral and intellectual virtues, then we achieve excellence, uh, which is virtuous behavior. And from that virtuous behavior, we achieve, we achieve a state of eudaimonia or um, uh, what might be called um, uh, human happiness, if you, to, to, um, uh, which is a, not a very good definition. Okay, so um, you may have taken the opportunity to do the wisdom scale. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, and you would be aware, I'm sure, that there are other scales. In fact, uh, Judith Gluck and uh, Monica Ardelt, I think, are going to be presenters. And both of those have developed scales. Um, 
uh, I've used both of those. Um, so they all have their uses. Uh, so the, the, the five that Webster uses, and it, it does seem from the literature that he, he, his scale does have pretty good validity. Um, and uh, so he has five subscales of the experience, emotional regulation, reminiscence, humor, and openness. And when you uh, undertook that um, scale, there were um, uh, eight questions leading to 40 questions all up. And these are examples of the questions that went with each of those subscales. Um, the humor one might be uh, an odd one for you. I keep saying that humor is not a, uh, I don't think it should be a subscale. What I think it is, is what I would call an epiphenomenon. Uh, and by that, I mean, it's the capacity to take things in your stride. Um, to not take yourself too seriously, to uh, in a situation look for um, the funny side. You know, they talk about black humour, for example. You know that when all is lost, you know, it's the person who can who can say, "Well, you know, <laughs> we're in a right mess here, aren't we?" You know, so so I don't think humour itself is, uh, you know, should be the subscribe, but I do see it as an epiphenomenon. I do know what he's what he's getting at there. Okay, so I'm just going to stop talking for a little while. And what I'd like to do is for you to take about three minutes to jot down some words that you think you would like said about you at your 70th birthday party. That's a, an event I had recently. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm afraid to say. Um, I don't know that many of these words came up, but... Uh, uh, the um, but th what would you like said about you at your 70th birthday party? Can you take two to three minutes, just jot down a few words about what you would like said about you? Now, if I get on to um, yeah. oh, good. Uh, is it on there? Yeah. And keep uh, yes, you can see over there. So that's this cream that is being shared. Oh, that's good. You can switch to this one's left part. Has everyone got at least two or three words? Okay, so don't be shy. Just, um, just. Uh, tell us what you what you would like said. Let's start with Edward. Do you want to me? I just put it yeah. on the table. And, and I said a kind, humble, reasonable, uh, a good company to be in. You want more? <laughs> no, that's that's a good start. Okay, uh, Soraya. <laughs> oh, I won't pick on you, Soraya. What about the? Uh, Nurja, no, no, two. Nurja. I just thought that you know somebody could remember what I've done for them to put an impact. I've impacted other people's lives. Uh, hang on, I'm just trying to impact people's life in a positive. Impact people's lives. Okay. Uh, where's the size? For this? Yeah, just double click on the menus. Yeah, I do have to yeah. very quickly. Yeah, going to a small little mark. Oh, smaller. A bit smaller still. Yeah. Uh, so that one was impact on people's lives. 
Thank you. Positive impact, Bernard. It has to positive. be positive. Positive, positive impact. Positive impact. <laughs> positive impact. Okay, that that could make a difference. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, we can't count here, is Keith? Professor Keith, you're on mute. Oh. Uh, okay. Right. I can hear you now. I said one is uh, caring and compassionate and then also made life a little happier for others. Could you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm, okay. I'm writing it up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ayan? Is Ayan there? Ayan? Yeah. Ayan, yep. probably. You're on mute, Ayan. Yeah. Uh, looks like we can't hear Ayan. No. Probably just dropped off. Okay. What about Ajinkya Navare? I said three words. Yeah. Uh, it was a positive person, kind and spiritual. I think we got kind, uh, spiritual is new. Yeah. And positive, and positive human being. Positive. Yeah. Cool. Um, Ranjani? No, Ranjani is our uh, academic uh, Assistant. Uh, oh, okay, uh, right. Manisha. <clears throat> Manisha? Uh, yes, sir. I said uh, happy and healthy. Happy and? Healthy. Healthy. Okay, and Kunal. Uh, so what I've said is I, on my 70th birthday, I would like people to say that they love me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like them to say that because uh, being with me helps them move forward and uh, they feel stress-free then when they are with me. What was your last bit? Uh, that they feel without stress. They don't feel any stress when they are along with me. They feel stress-free <laughs> there. The stress is released when they're with me. Okay. Is there someone who'd like to just put up their hand and, and add one or two more and then we'll stop? Yeah, I said that I would want people to remember me, that I help them find the true purpose in life. So more towards spirituality. Uh, okay, it's uh, okay, the spirituality. So we've yeah, got so helping others in finding their goal also. So one is my goal of spirituality and helping others also find their goal of spirituality. Okay. Basically, a higher purpose in life. Thank you. Is there anyone else wants to add one before we go? Uh, Elka, Elka, and Siddharth. Uh, uh, can I go? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, found most of the things I was looking for. You, what was? found most of the things which I was looking for. Ah, oh, right. Good. And Alka, you had your hand up. 
Alka, Alka already spoke. Alka, you may want to. I have already spoken. Uh, sorry, yeah. I All said right. uh, assisting others to find spirituality and a higher goal in life. Alka, right. you may okay. want to. Alka, gotcha. you may want to lower your hand. Gotcha. Thank okay, you. I'll do that. Sorry. Hmm. Okay. Look, we could go on, but we we don't have enough time. Um, Ali and I do this. Um, can Can you see? Uh, you can see on your screen what you just said there. Um, Ali and I do this with our students, and um, most of them are Chinese. And um, rarely would we find them say uh, wealthy, uh, powerful. Rarely. And in in fact, in one or two cases where someone did say wealthy, um, I asked them, and they said because I wanted to make sure that my parents could be looked after. So what looked like, you know, being a bit materialistic was in fact he was he was concerned about his parents. Okay. So the point that I'm making here is that this is the sort of thing, this is the sort of statement that um, that most people would say about their lives. And yet, and then what Ali and I do is that we then <laughs> say, well, these are these are sort of the, the values that you consider to be important. And then we get them to go out and uh, to exercise their values for two weeks <laughs> uh, where they where they they take something on, just one thing on. Um, and then we they report back about how that that went. Okay, so so I think it's pretty straightforward as to what what we're getting at here in terms of what I would call a telos. A telos. Now, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this term. And I begin with the really stupid question, how am I different from my cat, my 15-year-old cat, who's become quite annoying of late, but anyway, still a lover. Um, and the point I'm making about my cat is, does that cat have the capacity for developing a sense of telos, a sense of purpose in life? I don't think so. I might be wrong. I don't think so. I think it basically wants to sleep, then decides it's hungry and comes in mouths and gets fed. Uh, might brush past me a couple of times with some fake uh, affection. Um, I don't believe cats are <laughs> affectionate. Um, I think they have a means to an end. Um, but the, uh, okay, but you see my point is what do we mean by telos? And it's, I define it as an innate, or I don't define it. Um, the uh, philosopher Norton defined it as an innate end. His actualization through a process development constitutes the flourishing or fulfillment. Okay, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a bit heavy going. But I'm just going to leave that there for the time being because I pick up on this notion of flourishing uh, by myself uh, uh, later on. And then we have Immanuel Kant saying, determine yourself by yourself. Okay, um, so the point is, do we know, oops, just going back, do we know what our ultimate goals in life are? Do we take time out from the busy world of, of um, just doing things to know what we really want in life? Okay, so what I'm putting forward here is that a wise person would seek eudaimonia or evdaimonia as a healthy telos. Um, a, that would be their ultimate point. Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher, calls it human flourishing. There are other definitions there of what we mean by eudaimonia. Okay, so we have to have some sort of purpose in life in order um, you know, to, to be truly human. Okay, so I was going to get you to do the same with putting up some idea of virtues, what you think virtues are, but what I, I, I would We're probably running a bit short of time, so I won't do that. But I'd just like you to take a minute or two to just think what you think would be virtues that you would need in order to live a eudaimonic life, a life that is directed towards human flourishing. What would be the virtues that would be necessary?
Okay, well, there's plenty of people throughout history in various cultures who have thought about this. Um, an article by Dalsgrad in 2005 um, looked at various Western and Eastern traditions and came up with six virtues that they considered to be uh, uh, transcultural or cross-cultural. Uh, I don't consider wisdom to be a virtue. I think wisdom is an outcome of virtue, but it, in a lot of uh, literature, wisdom is considered as a virtue. Um, now, there's been <coughs> work done uh, about, about cross-cultural notions of virtue. Um, in fact, I collaborated with um, uh, two Indian scholars to produce a special philosophy of management, um, which was looking particularly at, um, at Indian um, wisdom tradition. Um, uh, Ali and I just completed a uh, an article for Journal of Business uh, Ethics, which has just been published, with a uh, an Iranian scholar on um, on Islamic uh, virtues. Ali has talked about Persian virtues, and that's that's his book there that he co-authored with um, uh, Sherry Spiller and Shi Ying Yang, uh, a colleague in Taiwan, uh, who we're both very conscious of at this time, given that Taiwan is is under a lot of pressure. Um, anyway, the, so the point that I'm making here is that you know I'm not just expressing a, a Western point of view here. You know these 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 virtues are broadly shared across humanity. I want to make the point that virtues are not the same as values. Um, values, um, I suppose, we could. Um, uh, we could understand as things that direct us towards ends. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Schwartz value circumplex, um, but the um, we did get our scholars, our, our students to to do this. And what again, what we found quite well, maybe not surprisingly, was that amongst these business students was that power rated very low. Um, on their on their values, I was I was amazed by that. Uh, they may have been doing it, you know, because that's the appropriate thing to say that you shouldn't say that you're looking for power. Uh, even so, it still came very low. But the point that I wanted to make to them is, you shouldn't assume power and say, oh no no no, I, you know that's that's just for greedy politicians or whatever. Whatever. And I say, well, you know, no. <laughs> Um, you know, Ob Obama, Gandhi, um, you, you know, the, the, these people sought power um, in order to bring about a better world. Um, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't eschew power simply because it doesn't sound right. We, you know, we should seek power by all means in order to be able to have some, um, some influence on, on the community, on, on society. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to say here that these these values that could be driving us could be simply achievement oriented or power oriented or because we're very conformist. Um, they may not be because we actually are self transcendent and that we have universal values or benevolent values. Um, and this is the this is the thing that we should be thinking about. To very quickly sum up, <laughs> when people ask me about wisdom, I, I have a ready answer. The two best predictors of wisdom are humility and openness to experience. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, uh, the Dunning-Kruger uh, effect. And as you can see from the scale, what it means is that the dumber you are, the smarter you think you are. <laughs> um, you only need to look at recent presidential history. Um, so... Um, and so what the bottom line is, is um, your, your actual uh, capability. And the top line is um, what you estimate your capability to be. Uh, and so you can see it's only at the, you know, in a very, you get up to about the, the 25th uh, percent mark before you start to get accurately uh, close to what you, what you really are. In terms of openness to, uh, to experience, openness, um, and intelligence uh, it, it, it has a very clear relationship. 
Um, and by intelligence, remember, we're talking about um, uh, crystallized and formal intelligence. Um, the other thing is that cognitive closure or the desire to sort of get an answer fast uh, tends to be associated with a, an authoritarian personality and with intolerance. And uh, uh, Ali and I recently collaborated with a colleague uh, where we had done work on the American presidential elections. Uh, and sure enough, uh, that notion of cognitive closure came up um, amongst those who were the Trump supporters. Okay, so I, I wanted to move move along here and just say that um, picking up on the on the Intazari model, it, it may appear linear, but in fact, what he's talking about here is what might be called embodied wisdom. And embodied means that it is um, wisdom that we carry in us, in our bodies. It's not something that we draw on. It's something that we have in our everyday habitus, which is a term that comes from Pierre Bourdieu. I'm sorry if I, you know, I say things and you know, you know the words and I'm, I sound like I'm explaining what you already know, but I'm, I'm not sure what you already know. But um, but habitus comes from, from Bourdieu uh, and he talks about it as a system of acquired dispositions. I really love that term. It's acquired dispositions through our life and, it's, and it affects everything that we do, the way that we walk, the way that we eat, the way that we talk, the way that we do things. Uh, but it also has to do with the way that we interact with other people. Um, so there are people who have um, done work on this um, in relation to embodying um, virtue in leadership. Uh, Vendelin Cooper's uh, colleague of ours uh, in, um, in France uh, has done a lot of work on, on this. And um, I wrote a chapter uh, in one of his books about the embodying virtue in leadership. Okay, so we've gone from the micro and um, now moving to the macro level. Um, and the thing is that there's Laura, very, Laura. very little. Hmm. Did, did someone want to raise a question there? No? Okay. Um, the, um, uh, okay, sorry. So I just wanted to say at the meso level, so what do we mean by meso level? We're talking about organizations, um, the, the way that organizations work. Now, the odd thing is that there's been very, very little done on it. And that's why David and I um, wrote this book um, uh, back in 2010, Wisdom and Management in the Knowledge Economy, um, because we wanted to generate uh, uh, research on this. Unfortunately, most of the work on organizational wisdom focuses around leadership. Now that's fine, but what if, you know, leaders are the people at the top. What you really should be doing, we, what David and I were, were, talk, were trying to establish was how do you create a virtuous space for wisdom to occur? Uh -huh. Now, the thing is that there's, as I say, very little research has been done on this. Um, and one of the people who did do something, this was 18 years ago, Linus and Hansen. Now, that article, which I found enormously useful, it's only been cited 47 times, and both Lemus and Hansen have disappeared in, into, I don't know, into oblivion. Uh, crazy. I don't know where they've gone, but they wrote this wonderful um, article and they devised a scale for measuring organizational wisdom. Uh, it, I find it baffling. But as I say, I think it's mostly because the focus has been on leadership. Okay, so what Lemus and Hansen said was that there are four factors that are consistent with uh, conceptual models of wisdom as a psychological construct. One, that you're broadly integrated in perspective, which means that you're not single-eyed, that you don't look down, you know, a sort of a narrow track. You take things in uh, from various perspectives, even if they don't sit very well together. Um, respect for human diversity, uh, having a practical political acumen. Um, and, and, and I have to say that the word political is a word that a lot of people don't like very much. Political can be used in terms of, you know, knowing how to, you know, knowing how to gain power and how to use power. Uh, I have no problem at all with the word political. Uh, I've been involved in party politics for over 30 years. Um, 
and uh, I think it's absolutely vital um, that that people develop political. But what he means here by political acumen is knowing from experience how things work, who are the real movers and shakers, how do you get things done? Okay, and then finally, sensitivity to the organization's culture. And then he talks about five general domains of, of value. Wise workers do these five things. Provide stability in changing and challenging environment. Now, what I thought was really interesting about um, things that were said about Queen Elizabeth on her death, most of it had to do around the notion of stability, that she provided stability. Um, and regardless of what you think about, you know, monarchies and, and the like, she is a head of state. Um, and I, I do think, although I'm not a, a, a monarchist, um, I do think she did an absolutely outstanding job as a head of state, you know, going from 1952 through to the, the present. Think of all the changes that happened in society. Think of the things that happened in her own family. Um, and yet she's like this, this ship of state that just sort of just kept on chugging through. Um, provide, and that's that was really important is to provide stability instead of shrieking. Uh, Unity under conditions of stress is related to that. Encouraging and promoting a civil and humane workplace. Uh, and I don't think that happens by codes, by the way. Uh, I'm, I have a thing about workplace codes. Uh, providing a sense of fairness and equity, and they are a source of vision and leadership. Now, I think that's a fabulous. Um, if you wanted to appoint a worker, you know, they would be five fabulous criteria. To measure that person on before appointing them. Okay, just a couple of quick things. Older people had a higher wisdom rating. Yay! Um, and um, I think, well, not I think, but it, that's largely because of political acumen that they developed over time. Um, and uh, what I found interesting is that it's connected to this notion of post-formal thought. Post-formal involves the non-rational, not the irrational, the non-rational, which is having intuition as well as experience. Okay, um, he did find, or they did find, that wisdom is least important in cultures that value attention to detail, aggressiveness, and decisiveness. Now, you might think, oh, mm, okay, well, think about it. You know, if you're landing a plane, you know, you're not wanting to <laughs> philosophize about, you know, physics and about, you know, the nature of, uh, you know, how beautiful the countryside is. Your job is to land that plane. Um, okay, so attention to detail and decisiveness. There are some times that uh, uh, David and I have just finished today um, the very final word with our PhD student who's been working on achieving values-based leadership in, de in the defence forces. And so there was this, you know, this real struggle between, you know, needing to be decisive, following orders, but also following, you know, your, your, your value uh, structure. Okay, so, so Organizational wisdom is an area that's wide open for study, and yet it hasn't been hasn't been done. Um, okay. Um, in terms of virtuous organizations, um, Moore and Beadle have written some good stuff about this too. Um, they conclude that capitalist organizations generally create an unconducive environment because of their fixation on external goods, notably profit. Um, and they say that even the presence of virtuous agents at both the level of practice and of the institution is unlikely to enable the achievement of a virtuous business organization. So I asked the question, is McIntyre overly pessimistic in his assessment? And the reason I have that chap there on the right, that's a guy called Mike Cannon Brooks, an Australian, um, who with his friend um, decided they didn't want to work for a company, but they just wanted to generate enough money um, to, to live uh, without having to, you know, say yes to a boss. They created a company called Atlassian and they made billions of dollars. He's a billionaire now. So instead of, you know, going around and spending the money and, you know, buying fancy clothes, he's, he takes his, um, 
his uh, clothing ideas, I think, from uh, the Ukrainian president. Um, he, he has actually in recent years um, been spending his time trying to buy out the biggest um, fossil fuel energy company in Australia and to convert it to a, um, a non-fossil fuel energy company. So I think there are some really interesting new entrepreneurs on the block, um, uh, younger people who might be um, who, who might be taking a different view about society. But that's uh, I'm just putting that out there. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, I, I won't go on. Uh, <laughs> this is a an annoyance mostly to people in Australia. Uh, but what I what I was going to say is that. Um, that this example of uh, Alan Joyce, who's the CEO of Qantas for the last seven or eight years or so, um, he's what I call a manager who manages by Excel spreadsheet. Um, and by that, I mean, it's so easy to just go into a spreadsheet and go, yeah, we'll get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them, and that, you know, will reduce our, our costs. Absolutely no idea of, you know, what that does to culture, what that does to the experience that's lost. So what we found was that, you know, yeah, they got rid of all the baggage handlers. What would baggage handlers know? They're just dumbos who throw bags on a plane. Well, no, Alan, baggage handlers have to put things on a plane in the proper way so that the plane's properly balanced. Um, and these people have 15 years of experience. You know, they know how to do things. And sure enough, what happened? Bags went missing. Um, he eventually came out with uh, with a pathetic fifty dollar voucher for people to say to say sorry. Uh, but you know he's lost he's lost customer loyalty, he's lost staff loyalty, uh, all because you know of this stupidity of um, what I would call you know Excel spreadsheet um, uh, leadership. So. Just very quickly, quickly picking up the point, Adam Smith makes the point that, you know, the capitalism, you know, it doesn't come out of a notion of benevolence. It comes out of self-interest. Now, he's very aware of the problems of self-interest. You know, a lot of pro-capitalist philosophers, you know, don't read the rest of Adam Smith where he, where he, where he picks up on that. Um, but so I'm not arguing against capitalism. I think capitalism does a wonderful job in particular ways in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of you know, um, getting efficiencies, in terms of, you know, creating new products and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but we need to be aware uh, of, of what that uh, what that means. Now, because I'm running out of time, I, I, um, I'll just leave that there. But um, uh, the uh, it, you can come back and have a look at that. And my slides slides later on. Um, all right, so we've dealt now with the micro and the meso. Now I want to have a look at the macro level. Um, okay, so first of all, what worries me about a lot of people coming out of schools, out of universities, and out of business schools is that there is absolutely they have no sense of political or economic history, you know, about where we came from, how things developed. Um, so just very quickly, I won't go through all this, but we know that capitalism emerges initially, you know, late, uh, early 1800s in, in, in the UK as industrial capitalism. Then in the 1970s, we have post-industrial capitalism. Then we have financial capitalism, which is um, uh, based really on just what, um, David and I called an irrealis economy, um, which is that that wealth is created out of things that don't actually produce bricks and mortar that produce things. And so what we did in 2012 was that we did a, an analysis of, um, uh, of financial papers, coverage of the, the, the crisis. And it was really interesting to see that the word real economy started to come back into, into usage. Well, what was happening before? Yes, an unreal economy. Um, okay, and then of course we have the gig economy, which is really based on deunionizing and entrepreneurializing uh, people, which is not really true. It just means that they don't have, 
the safeguards of unions. Okay, um, the other thing that, that is happening with uh, contemporary uh, in a macro sense in organisations is this desire to measure everything. Um, there's um, a very interesting book put out by Michael Power called The Audit Society. Um, and very recently, another book by uh, Joseph Muller called The Tyranny of Metrics. Uh, and the point that, um, the point that, that he, he makes about the tyranny of metrics is that you end up with unintended consequences. You end up with paradoxical outcomes. For example, this is what I mean. That when you have police having crime cleanup rates, you might think, yeah, good, you know, let's let's clean up crime. Well, what are coppers going to do to have good cleanup rates? Choose the lowest people down, the easy ones to nab, the stupid criminals, okay, that are easy to nab, and say, yes, look, look at this, we've got a 96% cleanup rate. Meanwhile, the big guys are sort of playing havoc with society. School literacy and numeracy. Um, testing. You know, I, I believe that there should be that done, but when it's publicized, what it does is it means that teachers teach to the test. Surgeons who refuse to take on difficult surgery because it might affect their, um, their rate of recovery. And then, of course, I won't get into the area that just drives me balmy, which is um, academics research profiles, um, which is, which is, you know, just destroyed um, a lot of research in universities. The other thing that we're really concerned about is what we call codification of everything. Uh, and David and I talk talk about this as, you know, when you bring in codes, uh, you de-skill ethics. So codes simply, are that when you bring in, that might sound odd. You might think, well, you know, codes are really important. Yes, they are, but not when they, they regulate everything to the finest degree. Now, this uh, Gian Battista Vico was a 16th century Italian philosopher, and he, he devised four types of manage, you know, managers, and I'll give you two of them. One was the imprudent savant, who moves in a straight line from general to particular proofs, uh, truths in order to for, burst through the tortuous, tortuous curves of life. What does that mean? What, what it means is, when you've got a code and someone who lacks intuition, intelligence, um, and some sort of capability, they will simply apply the code um, mindlessly instead of saying, you know, why is the code there? What's it supposed to be doing? How can we apply this code sensibly? Okay, versus the wise person uh, who sees the complexity of life. And I just wanted to give you a, a a quick example of this, the, the rat case in, um, in 2008. This guy was a classical archaeology scholar, Christopher Ratt, and, or Ratter, or whatever, how you pronounce that. Anyway, he, he took his boy to watch a, uh, a game, uh, the D Detroit Tigers game, and he went to buy what he thought was lemonade, um, but it was alcohol, alcoholic lemonade. And sure enough, the surveillance cameras picked it up he was hauled out. Um, the child was taken off him for six months. Um, and yet, you know, no one had the intuition, the good judgment to say, what's going on here? Oh, uh, you know, this, you know, this bullhead, you know, <laughs> professor, archaeology professor didn't realize, you know, that it's that it's got alcohol in it. You know, silly Christopher, you know, don't do it again. Instead, his life was thrown into utter turmoil. His child was put into an institution for six months um, because of this, this mindless application, this unwise application of codes. Okay, I want to move on also in terms of looking at the macro. Uh, if we don't understand the way in which our current conditions um, are occurring, we have to understand that you know Western imperialism and Western colonialism has been responsible for a lot of the problems that ha have happened in the world today. We look at the Middle East, we look at you know what happened after World War One and Two, but they simply drew maps on a line and cut things up. Um, and then of course you know the the, the problem of, of Israel and uh, Palestinian rights. You know of course uh, Europe was racked with the guilt of of the Holocaust. 
Uh, but, you know, was it a very sensible solution to do what they did? And then, of course, we know that global warming is largely caused by Western industrialization. Okay, so all of these things have some sort of historical root that we need to understand. Um, and I just wanted to um, make the point that that we've also seen since the 1970s, uh, um, you know, various ideologies emerge, mostly a neoliberal ideology, um, which is now, because of COVID, has, has been obliterated. Um, the, um, but what has happened with a neoliberal uh, ideology is that it economized everything, it commodified everything, education, healthcare, um, caring for children, education, um, Globalization, good in many ways, but it also led to the exploitation of labor. You know, are you aware that there are 28 million people who are slave laborers in the world? Uh, poor regulation leading to things like the Rana Plaza collapse in 2013. Um, supply chains working on a just-in-time basis. Well, didn't we find out that was a problem? Um, and it's interesting that we're hearing the um, that people are now using, no, not just in time, we should be developing just in case. We should have things on, uh, you know, uh, on the shelf, just in case. Um, just as a little point, uh, I'm on a number of pharmaceutical medicines and the, the pharmacist has had to apologize to me on a number of occasions saying, I'm sorry, we just do not have it on the shelf. You know, that was unheard of in Australia. Um, the uh, and then, of course, Europe developed its dependency on Russian oil and gas instead of uh, thinking about being, um, well, uh, fossil free and also being more independent. And then, of course, we have China's Belt and Road policy and the aggression that's occurring uh, in, in, um, in Taiwan. OK, and finally, of course, we have India's emergence economically. And I also wanted to make the point it's a cultural emergence. Um, and, um, you know, just two quick things I, I draw attention to, you know, the Bollywood culture, uh, the and the fact that <laughs> India now controls cricket in the world. Um, I, uh, I don't know if many of you follow cricket, but um, I think one of the most wonderful uh, shows I saw was about Kapil Dev um, winning the 1983 World Cup. The, the Indian board didn't even, uh, they had them boarding the plane before the finals because they didn't even think they'd make it to the finals. Um, but Kapil Dev, this, you know, this humble bloke, uh, managed to get them through to the finals. And since since then, India has, has turned the tables on the West. Um, but I wanted to make the point that, you know, at the macro level, we might think it's all a bit overwhelming. Uh, it's the thing over, over which we have least control but we mustn't mindlessly let it control our future. There is no such thing as an ideology-free zone. So to not be involved in something, to go along with something is to support it, okay? You can't be ideology-free. When you do something, when you buy something, you are enacting some sort of ideology. So there is no ideology-free zone in every choice that we make. Okay, so um uh as i say if you're not part of the problem then uh part of the solution then you're part of the problem so we need to think at the micro level the choices that we make the agency that we express in organizations a contribution to community and a broader notion of being political in terms of you know are we getting there well global poverty uh we'd have to say as Probably, you know, we're making inroads on that. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, there's obviously clear cases where that's not the case. Uh, and it's very patchy across the globe and even within countries. But we do seem to be making some uh, headway with that. In terms of inequality, uh, no. Uh, in developed countries like Australia, inequality margin has, has risen. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gini coefficient. Um, but uh, you can see, for example, here, uh, India is, um, where are my colors here? Um, 
their GD coefficient is around about 0.35 to 0.4. Australia, uh, about 0.25 to 0.3. Uh, but you could look at some of these areas where, where there is massive um, uh, inequality uh, throughout the world. So, um, okay, so I, I wanted to now, in the last bit of time that I have, because uh, we need you to say something, uh, I just wanted to pick up on the issue of the environment as, as, a, as a macro issue. And uh, in my module, a second module that I gave to you, I said that, that um, the survival ecological footprint is 1.7 hectares per person. Uh, in 2012, the average was 2.84. So we're using up the world faster um, than it can survive. It's unsustainable. So what can we do about it? The micro, meso and macro level. Okay, some good news. Um, renewable energy uh, is is going ahead in huge bounds. So, uh, you know, I've been involved in the environment movement for over 30 years now, and I, you know, I'm a confirmed pessimist. But in terms of um, renewable energy, uh, these figures are staggering, um, largely because of the, the incredible reduction in the cost of uh, non-fossil fuel um, uh, sources of energy. Uh, we've seen just in the last month. Uh, Biden getting a 0.3 trillion dollar uh, budget through, but remember he only got that through with the casting vote of Kamala Harris, the vice president, it was locked 50 all in the Senate, um, and that within a month, uh, 426 million of private investment went into renewable energy. Uh, there's, I don't know if you're familiar with the Global Finance Zero Emission Pledge. This is a coalition of the world's biggest financiers who have committed $130 trillion, <laughs> trillion to uh, hit zero, uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And although I've been doubtful about China, my most recent uh, reading of it and talking to people has been that they have been performing pretty well in terms of renewable energies. Um, but the trouble is that we, you know, the earth is still in mortal danger. Deforestation, 10 million uh, hectares a year is being deforested. Habitat destruction, uh, unsustainable versus regenerative uh, agriculture. Australia, by the way, because it's the oldest continent, it has the lowest amount of soil, uh, topsoil, uh, and yet when whites came to Australia in the late 18th century, they brought their English ways of doing things. Uh, and what happened? Whatever topsoil was there, they knocked down all the trees, just got washed into the river and washed, you know, washed into the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Um, so we virtually have no topsoil left. So what do they do then? They go and buy lots of superphosphate. Um, and then, of course, the overconsumption of food sources, uh, and this is where the West is probably, um, well, not probably, is uh, a greater offender than, than the East in general. Um, just wanted to say something about comparing Australia and India here. Um, Australia has had an embarrassing and appalling government for the last 10 years that just got tossed out. Uh, and very quickly, we passed a climate change bill. It wasn't as good as it should have been. I said before that I'm very political. I'm happy to say that I worked very hard for a Greens candidate who got up in our local area here. And um, she's part of parliament and uh, a whole bunch of Greens got elected and they pushed the Labor government to put, put this through. 43% is not enough, but it's a start. Um, Australia has a car addiction. We have a high carbon footprint of six hectares per capita. Uh, and we are the world's third largest fossil fuel exporter. Uh, in terms of um, uh, India, their latest NDC, which is their nationally determined contribution to the IPCC, was a bit of a damp squib, I'm sorry to say. Um, their two key goals, 50% non-fossil fuel electricity generation by 2030. Um, it really is not an advance on their previous one. And they also dropped their target of 450 gigawatts uh, of 
fossil free. Uh, there are some really interesting things. A good colleague of mine uh, is collaborating with people in uh, India on a, a range of projects with this group down here, the um, Institute for uh, Energy, Economics and Financial Analysis, uh, working on things like agrivoltaics and uh, land use. Just, just to make a little point here, um, uh, the, the amount of land that would be needed in India to put up um, solar panels and wind uh, wind machinery would represent 2.9% of your 3.3 million hectares. Okay, I'm just saying, let's think about it. Is that is that doable? You know, um, it's it's worth thinking about. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about India, I think, is that uh, you know they, it could be a much more non-distributed electric system. Um, I mean, you would know this better than I, but but the, um, the the distribution of electricity from the generators is is generally pretty poor. So if you actually had non-distributed and you actually had localized um, uh, uh, energy production, uh, that would probably produce a, a better outcome. But look, I'm very conscious of you know me, <laughs> white Australian, you know telling you Indian people who most of you, I think probably have technical degrees, um, uh, you know, what you should be doing. But I just wanted to, I just want to draw your attention to, to, to those things, which I think are quite exciting um, and very possible. Um, and so I want to end, you know, with this, uh, with this very big macro issue uh, that your environment minister, uh, Bupendra Yadav, um, has called for a fair share of the remaining carbon budget for developing countries. And India has consistently raised the issue of historical responsibility, which is, I think is a fair, fair argument. You know, like you guys created a mess. Um, why should we be, you know, picking up the cost? Um, so, but I think it is a, I think it's a really important question, really an important ethical question uh, that, uh, that 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 you know, people of your generation um you know have to deal with and have to come come to my point would be that you know even so you know setting aside the the historical responsibility which i think the west should be acknowledging and paying for um the the, the fact is you can't that doesn't help very much when you <laughs> when your cities are you know 35 to 45 to 50 degrees you know we saw in pakistan recently 51 degrees you know for god's sake um, you know, how is this helping um, the ordinary person? So, so it, I'm, I'm leaving with a question. I'm not, I'm not, you know, trying to preach or anything. I'm just saying, what intellectual and moral virtues would be needed to answer a question like that? Okay. So, to sum up, then, what I've been saying is that we've moved to an Anthropocene era, um, a new, uh, it's a new epoch, which is. Um, which is described as that because it is a human caused geological epoch. Okay, we've, I think, moved away from that underlying life force or principle of belongingness to the biosphere that I began this, this presentation with. Um, we've also um, talked about wisdom as the exercise of virtue. And we said that the pursuit of virtue produces uh, eudaimonia or human flourishing. Um, and I've identified here the, the uh, Aristotelian virtues of both intellectual and, and, and moral virtues. Okay, so I, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. I'm sorry I've taken a long time, um, but I hope that I have um, said something that's of, of some use, some new value, some interest, uh, and I hope I've stirred some of you to say something back. Yes thank, yes, thank you, uh, Bernard. And uh, I'm really opening the, uh, the, the discussion here. Uh, of course, our, our PhD students and also colleagues and faculty, anyone who has some questions, and uh, please jump in or some comments, whatever. I mean, it will be, I mean, it's really a privilege to have Bernard with us. You have seen the 
the level of your thinking, not just like uh, uh, looking at this micro level where usually we are placing our wisdom, let's say, thinking into and showing the linkage between this macro, meso, and uh, and micro, and, uh, and and finally pointing out some like immediate challenges we are facing at the macro level, but which needs both at a micro and a meso level, maybe some intervention, some change on our side. So the question on my side is that, uh, 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 Bernard, what would be, uh, just to initiate the conversation, what would be uh, according to you? So you have pointed out what the need of investing more in research in this uh, meso level, in this, this organizational wisdom, but also uh, uh, the relationship between what is needed to be done at the macro level and what how a wisdom based approach would help to bring together communities and companies and individuals to, uh, to 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 build this future that we, which is of course desirable yeah so is this one area where really you would encourage our phd student to work on if of course if they are interested in that yeah, well, thank you for beginning that, um, Soraya. And uh, I think there are two things that I'd say in response is, um, first of all, you know, we spend a lot of money uh, on organisational psychologists, you know, to <laughs> to measure people coming into organisations. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I think there are some very useful uh, measures that are done there. Uh, I think those measures are certainly important, things like the the, you know, the defence forces and the police to make sure we don't get psychos coming in. Uh, but so I'm, I'm not I'm not arguing against that. But what I would be saying is, you know, what's what sort of person do you want in this organisation? And, you know, are they people who um, uh, have a have a set of values and virtues um, that um, that are going to advance the organisation uh, as a a, a proper organization that's that's uh, leading to eudaimonic outcomes that's prepared to take the longer term view to to even if it means short term uncomfortableness um, or short term unpopularity. Um, I think this is where China, and I'm I'm not a big fan. Don't get me wrong of the current Chinese leadership, but this is where I think China, uh, you know can teach us something in terms of taking the long-term view. Um, you know, they, they're talking about 20 to 40 years. And yet, you know, and, and I've got money invested on the stock exchange and I have a bit of a bit of a peep every day to see how things are going. It's been a bit bad the last couple of days, I have to say. But, you know, the, what I'm saying is that, and we all know this, that, you know, that, um, you know, they respond very erratically to you know little bits of information you know a, an inflation figure comes out from the usa that's you know that's a little bit higher than expected and it you know drops two and a half percent you know several billions of dollars that, that go down you're thinking you know like heaven's sake that this is a temporary thing this is not something that we un didn't expect you know of course inflation's going up uh, just go to the local supermarket and you know you, you know it's going up um the um Okay, so what am I saying out of all that? I'm saying that that you need people who are um, who embody it, who who have the the virtues and the values that you would be looking for, um, and then and and of those, um, there you need also a degree of agency. Uh, are these people who are prepared to be agentive if they're given? The opportunity, or will they just look up the the book of rules or the code, or this is how you do stuff as though uh, you know you, you, you're flying a plane? Um, so I think it's it has to do with the sort of people that we choose. Uh, we then have to talk about the way that the organisation operates. Um, you know, are we prepared to allow people to make choices, um, make decisions, so that they're not you know, they're not being held to account for every last thing. They're not being measured on everything. Uh, you're looking at what's, you know, if we look at more, at, you know, from a project perspective, what's your project? What's the outcome? How are you going to get there? Um, and then allow people to get on with the job and, you know, act in a civil way. So I think that that you, so that's what I'm saying. You, there's the two things. One is to create 
the framework, the organisational framework that would allow people to act in a virtuous way uh, and in an intelligent way, in a cooperative and collaborative way. Um, and and then, uh, then also, but make sure that you have the right personnel for that. Thank you, Bernard. A anybody, please, I uh, would like to open this. Anyone? Maybe everyone's gone to sleep here. And, uh, yeah. I'm retired. Oh, yeah. yes. I'm really um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Bernard McKenna for the wonderful, insightful presentation and whole organizational team for this really wonderful um, series of wise leadership. Um, I had a question regarding the content uh, where you presented the second model of uh, this wise leadership, um, where the intuitive thinking or reasoning was put under the theoretical uh, wisdom or theoretical reasoning. Um, in my layman's, um, uh, uh, let's say layman's um, perspective, I would put intuition or intuitive thinking in a practical reasoning. And I would like to know more how, um, why is it in theoretical um, reasoning and how is it, um, in what ways is it connected with um meso and macro level wisdom yeah um the the thing about intuition um uh, i think is that uh it it largely arises i think um uh out of uh out of an an intelligence that occurs because of experience, but also the capacity to reflect on that experience. So you could have a person who's had a lot of experience, flown all over the world, done lots of things, uh, but if they don't have that reflectiveness uh, about, you know, well, why did that occur? How did that come about? Um, the um, So I think that intuition, when we say it's non-rational, um, what I'm saying is that we, we can't, draw together any logic paths um, that will, you know, lead to some outcome. Because it's not just, a, you know, it emerges, as I say, out of experience and reflection. But remember that the cognitive is also strongly associated with the moral um, and that that we, um, uh, our moral self uh, is also involved in the way that we understand things. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, for example, H-A-I-D-T has written a lot about this. But uh, so what I'm saying is that is that um, uh, is that intuition is uh, is as I say built out of it. It's not just something you, you know. People think, oh, our intuition is just like a gut instinct, as though it came out of nothing. You know, we don't have a gut instinct out of nothing. We we develop gut instincts from from experience. Um, I think there are probably some things, um, let's just say, you know, going back to my cat example, you know, they have a sort of a gut instinct about, you know, not, not being near birds of prey or, you know, um, it, all sorts of things like that. But humans are born with very little instinctual capability. Um, and so it's it's from uh in fact you know we have to tell children you know not to touch the hot stove and things like that that's what i'm getting at but instinct develops uh when in intuition develops um from experience but also thinking about that experience but it, it's intuition is also um uh, intellect linked with experience linked with a moral um capability as well <coughs> Uh, may I come in? Yeah, Rajan, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Professor McKenna, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Very inspiring presentation. Oh, in the you. sense, in the sense that uh, what I liked was the way you have gone into the details and components. I think makes it much more amenable to research into a daunting field, uh, given the current uh, uh, neoliberal context. 
but the, i just wish to add ask a question for your consideration that uh, you know uh, you you of course mentioned that we have to look at the people who are brought into the organization uh, uh, there is some research which is being which is happening in iit mumbai close to where this conference is being held where uh, a lot of uh, experimental research is being done to see whether yoga based uh, practices <clears throat> meditation and some other yoga based practices actually have the potential to improve perhaps the perspective the moral values the virtues so uh, <clears throat> have you come across any such work and would you uh, consider looking at it in your research program and the institute as p jain can also look into it yeah, no, thank you thank you very much for those kind words rajan and and thank you for the question um the uh i think it's something that indian institutions are probably going to do a lot better than western institutions um okay, yes um because david and i have this thing about um you know institutions that suddenly go oh let's have some mindfulness you know so they <laughs> spent the whole week you know um exploiting people and being horrible and uh, being uh, you, you know egocentric and all the like and then suddenly at the end we'll we'll have a session of mindfulness you know and, uh, <laughs> And I'm thinking, no, 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 that, it doesn't work like that. You know, it's, it's, um, and to be honest, I'm still not sure what the hell mindfulness is supposed to mean. I, I went to a British Academy of Management's half day session on mind, mindfulness and came away even more confused. Um, but from what I think yoga, from my absolutely zero knowledge of yoga, it, but I guess it has to do with notions of mindfulness. Um, and, uh, I think that given your cultural tradition, it's something that um, that would probably work a whole lot better uh, in your culture than in ours. I, I don't know. David spent some time in cross culture. David, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which ones am I going to share? Um, I, um, well, I guess one of the misconceptions about mindfulness is that it's um, it's a, a special um, activity that uh, only exists historically in the East, but uh, that's actually not true. Um, there's a there's a very old um, tradition of mindfulness um, in in Europe as well. So I think. Mindfulness is both a, a very simple and a very complex thing. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to get into trying to define exactly what it is um, tonight because it means different things to different people, but somehow it all connects to con concentration, which then connects to uh, decluttering of the mind and um, a rise in the, in the clarity of thinking. And... Um, and also uh, clarity from a, a much higher perspective as well. So if we're talking about human flourishing, um, it would relate to that. And uh, if it also includes a more cosmic uh, perspective, then it would in include that as well. So I think, I think all people have the capacity to do mindfulness and all people have the capacity to become uh, better and more genuine people uh, and make a far better, uh, less egotistical um, presence in the world than, than they currently do. So um, I know uh, Surya and I are, are working with a colleague at the moment on um, um, an article on contemplative curriculum and um, uh, based on the, the experience of using yoga in an MBA class in uh, in uh, France at the Kedge yeah. Business School. And yeah. um, th there's no doubt that it can help. Um, but, but as you say, Bernard, it's, it's got to be done in an authentic 
way and um, it's got to become part of a way of, of living, uh, part of a way of interacting with, with the world. Um, shaped by, you know, by virtuous intentions. And um, yeah, so look, I, I think there's, there's huge scope for improving um, the way the corporate world thinks and, and the way it sees itself interacting with our environment and trying to deal with uh, climate change and uh, global conflict and water security, food security, all of those sorts of things. So uh, yeah, I think yeah. there's, there's huge scope. I think that's that's my answer. Thanks. I think it's, uh, and I don't want to get into dangerous territory here, but I, I, think, I think it's perhaps one of the um, problems of the secularization of Western society. And, you know, can I just say that I, I was raised as a very devout Catholic, but I have since called on my Catholicism. Um, but looking back on it, I, I do see, you know, that there were things that if they were framed in a slightly different way, that would be very valuable. So, for example, just the notion of a Sabbath, you know, the Christian notion of a Sabbath, you know, coming out of the Old Testament, the seventh day rested, uh, you know, so it was a day that everyone stopped. Um, and, you know, they read <laughs> the scripture was, was you know, chosen for them. But, and, and in terms of reflection, you know, from my Catholic upbringing, you know, it was only ever looking back at what had I done wrong, you know, you know. <laughs> so it was very, it was very negative, you know, that you know you'd been sinful and horrible, and you had original sin. But what I'm saying, despite all that, you know, maybe you know what I'm saying is that there was a, you know, that the time was set aside for the reflective, for the, you know, to not be rushing around. Uh, to take time out uh, and, you know, maybe the secular West is sort of rediscovering that in, in some way. Thank you. Thanks to you as well as to David. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if, I may add, if I may add a comment, uh, since uh, I'm, I'm not a part of the uh, SPJAN Institute, but I have some good friends there. Uh, and I don't know if you know, SPJN Institute has established a special center or department for looking into this aspect of uh, spirituality and business and those things. Uh, uh, and I yeah. think uh, that center can take up some research into this domain, uh, good research. And yeah. I believe the second thing which has to be done by business schools is to re-examine their own culture whether that culture is promoting uh, <clears throat> uh, virtues or it is prom <laughs> uh, promoting only the vices which have come into play during the neoliberal uh, revolution. So I think uh, at an institutional level, looking at the institute as an organization, it, it can also think, each institute can think, but since SP Jain has taken this initiative to create a center, I think not only that center stands uh, apart, just like you said, you have a session on <laughs> mindfulness at the end of one week. Similarly, in an organization uh, and in management institute should also examine whether its general values are consistent with virtues or not. So that is a humble submission to the community <laughs> which is organizing this conference. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to especially my friend Keith and uh, my young friend Ajinkya, who are part of this institution. Thank you. Thanks, Rajan. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. I think we have um, uh, five minutes uh, remaining. I, I would like to take some uh, other questions, maybe from our uh, PhD students. Yes, Kuna. Yeah. Yeah. So I put this question out in the chat actually. So when we talk about wisdom, we typically tend to talk about it at a business level or at an organization level. But perhaps the, the ship has already sailed by that time because a lot of wisdom will get generated as you grow up. So at very early years in a in an individual's life. So what do you think? What's your perspective on research opportunities? 
in this space of building early years wisdom amongst individuals. Is that's that's perhaps the place where you need to impact it the most for for society to 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 grow really really well uh, and and all these sorts to come together eventually. Colonel, uh, just uh, just stay uh, stay on so I can just make sure I've got your question. So, is your question largely around um, the you know the fact that virtue reveals itself in adulthood or whatever? Are you talking about how you achieve that virtue from yes yes yeah. it's more about how do you impact it at the time of life where it's more mm. most important to do and mm. that's perhaps a space which uh, so how do we how do we study that what's your perspective on the way the world is is observing that space uh, where mm. we could actually create create significantly higher impact yeah and, and yeah yeah it, it's it's actually um Ah, it's an area I've thought about a lot um, because you you get um, quite um, odd situations where you have you know people have been well brought up, given a good education, parents have been decent people, um, and they you know they emerge into adulthood and they're just horrible, uh, horrible human beings. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, you know, children who come out of the most dire circumstances and, you know, manage to somehow, uh, you know, make it to adulthood and get into a job and behave decently. Um, I, I honestly don't know, Kunal. Um, I, I think you'd have to say in general that, you know, the, the way that we are raised, um, you, you know, is tremendously important uh, in terms of how, um, you know, our, our plastic brain, you know, makes connections, how we uh, respond to things, um, how we understand the world, how we treat other people. Um, uh, yeah, so much of that is done even in the first two years of life. You know, it, it's, 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 when you think about it, though, you know, I had four children and I look back on it and I had them very early in my life and I, Oh, oh my God! If I knew then what I know now, I don't know that I would have had them. You know, like um, you know the the you know the enormous responsibility. Um, but um, yeah, look, I, I I suppose that you'd have to say that um, that having you know growing up in a space that's you know that is uh, reinforcing of good behaviours. But what I think is a problem for developed countries is that I don't think our children learn resilience. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, there are so many children who grow up, uh, and I don't, I'm not just talking about, you know, Asian uh, countries and that, I, I'm talking about, you know, growing up in the Ukraine, for example, you know, where the hell did that resilience come from? You know, um, what sort of culture develops that? Um, so I, I think that it's uh, it, it you know there are certain things that that you know come from our comfortable lifestyle, which means that children aren't exposed to some um, awful things in life, some awful decisions to make early on. Um, so look, I'm, I'm not giving you a good answer at all. Uh, what I am trying to say is that, and this, I was a high school teacher for 14 years. Um, I was very conscious of being a mentor. Uh, I had working class boys for the first six years, and I was very conscious of, of uh, not saying that they were only a success if they went to uni, but at least that I'd opened up the possibilities that I was a mentor. I played cricket, I played football, I took the debating team, I was, you know. Uh, and I made sure that I, I hoped I was a good male role model. Um, so I think that there are, you know, there are, there are definitely, um, and I, I can only talk very much more from a male side, that having good male role models is really important. Um, uh, you know, there are so many families that, that don't have a father. you know, 
it encourages children to behave properly, to have the right instincts, to use their agency increasingly. Uh, that's really, really important. But uh, there's also needs to be uh, times where children face uh, difficult situations that they have to just take on themselves. Um, and for those who don't have that, that upbringing, um, then, then you know, it, there there's must be some, some fundamental instinct there that just keeps them going through the tough times. Um, so, so I don't know. I, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, I think it's well worth looking at. There, there haven't been any real studies that I know of that have followed people, uh, apart from the Valon studies, you know, that were done from what, about 1949 in Harvard, uh, that followed people through their life. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, good question. I haven't given you a good answer, sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid we have to close it here to 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 honor the the, the timing we have given to all of you. Uh, it has been really uh, very interesting, uh, Bernard, to bring this approach of wisdom at this level. I I think it's what I would uh, let's say take it if I was a young researcher, which I, I I'm not at all, is that uh, opening some new avenues to try to adopt a wisdom-based approach, for example, to start with this collective wisdom, what it is and what is an organization and how can we look at you suggested, like uh, first of all, how we recruit people and then how we develop them within an organization according to this uh, different dimensions and so on. So it's a simple kind of uh, project, but then there are so many other things you have added to uh, Bernard and thanks a lot and I hope it has been useful for all of you. So please, uh, all of you, thanks ag again for being with us. Keep in touch, we have more coming in this series of uh, this wisdom presentation with all our friends, some friends of Bernard, David, and, uh, uh, and uh, Ali was uh, also been uh, here today. So thanks to all of you to contribute to making this series Betty alive and become a, 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 a platform for discussing and gathering ourselves and thinking, uh, let's say, provocative sometimes and innovative ways. Thanks a lot to everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to the uh, students for, uh, for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you.